10th chapter of St. John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated. <clears throat> Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was growing up, some of the TV programs that were my favorites were the, the Westerns. And in these Westerns, they had good guys and bad guys. The good guys sometimes wore white hats. And the bad guys could be identified because they'd wear black hats. But also, when they'd be out doing their bad deeds, out robbing a bank or a store, they put a mask across their face. And that way you really knew that they were the, the bad guys of these shows. The ones needing to be defeated. Isn't it ironic in that this new coronavirus world that we live in, it isn't the bad guys that are forced to wear the masks across the face but you and me. And this coronavirus is a bad guy, shaping our lives, stealing from us our lives and our liberties, and, and, and for many of us, um, our finances and means of making a living. The coronavirus is the thief climbing into the sheepfold by the gate. Or not by the gate, but over the fence, coming unexpectedly and very obtrusively into our lives. And I don't like it a bit. I gotta tell you that a large part of communication to me is the face. There's the voice is essential, and the tone of voice, and those kind of things that we, we listen for. But communication is also what we see on others' faces. And people that study this say that we have, all have micro-expressions that sometimes are not noticeable that they happen so quickly unless you understand what's happening. But there's a part of us that, as we communicate with each other, is aware of those micro-expressions and can help us in learning how to, to communicate and understand and help each other. If we know what's happening and what's happening inside us as we Notice those things on a deep level, maybe not on a conscious level, but subconsciously we communicate. And now, that's being taken away from us. And 
to me that's disturbing to have to go into the doctor or to go in the store and have to talk to other people with their faces covered. Because part of our communication is being cut off. We are being robbed from that kind of way of communicating with one another. And we can't even touch one another. One of the things that I learned as a pastoral care student, and I remember it was a nurse talking about this, um, how important it was for patients in the hospital as, as we pastoral care students would come and visit to be able to touch and how much we need to touch one another. Even if this virus is not robbing us of our wealth, if we're well enough set, we don't have to worry about that. It's robbing us of our ability to connect with each other, to support each other, and to, um, to be neighbors to each other out in the world. And it has constricted and held in our lives. We are sheep penned in by this thief in the night. Jesus, and I'm wondering if when Jesus talked about being the good shepherd, if, if he had in mind the 23rd Psalm, that beautiful and favorite psalm of many of us that talks about being led out and made to lay down in green pastures and being led beside still waters being led out into the world. Jesus comes to us who need to be led, who need to find nourishment and refreshment, who need to, to be able to be out in the world, but to be kept safe and to be guided in the right pathway. Our second reading from 1 Peter is part of that guidance. The letter, interestingly, as we have it read this morning, has cut off verse 18. Now there's a reason why the lectionary people did not um, include that, because it, it brings up something that's troublesome about the second reading, because the second reading is written to slaves. And that's a difficult issue for the church because the Bible does not come out condemning slavery from the beginning. It kind of accepts that slavery is a part of the culture of the peoples that were part of the Roman Empire. The Romans had a hierarchy of people from top to bottom, and, and the slaves were, of course, at the bottom. And the early Christians and the early church had no illusions that they were going to have any clout to change Roman society. And so the early church, biblical writers did not take on that issue. And that's a little bothersome. That, uh, that things like 1 Peter are talking to slaves as if that their situation was, wasn't wrong or couldn't be reversed. And of course we know that's not true. And it's also out of the scriptures that, that Christians have opposed slavery and thankfully overturned it in our nation. But 1 Peter here is addressing slaves, and that's a remarkable thing. There are other writers that would write to help uh, people as they were living their lives, but no other writers were addressing slaves because they were low on the totem pole, no status, nobody to be noticed. The author of 1 Peter notices. 
and addresses them as full members of the kingdom of God. That's part of the green pastures and still waters that Jesus leads us out into as we lead our lives in this harsh world. You are a beloved child of God and you are important enough for God to take notice and to care about you in this world and how you're going to deal with the suffering in your life. And 1 Peter goes on to talk about how to deal with suffering. It is to deal with it the way Christ dealt with it. For this you have been called, he writes, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. That's an idea that Martin Luther King Jr. used in his great I Had a Dream speech as he was speaking to the descendants of the slaves. Maybe some of them had experienced slavery. Out, I believe, by the Washington Monument. And as we were going through that great upheaval in the 60s to bring about civil rights in our nation, Martin Luther King said to those people who were there to listen to him, I'm not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. It's a dream also that was rooted in the scriptures and in being children of God in following the Good Shepherd who leads us out into green pastures and still waters, that says to each of us here, you are a beloved child of God. In our baptism, God says over us, with you I am well pleased. But that does not excuse us from suffering. But the bad shepherds, the, the thieves, and, the, and those who would rob from us in this life for their own purposes would say, you got to feel bad about this. you got to point the finger and point and assign blame. you got to fight against this and, and be angry and upset and wallow in despair. The good shepherd says, follow me. Follow me in the kingdom. Follow me in the good news of being a child of God. And I will be with you in the tough times and in the suffering. I'll be with you to make that a creative experience, to use it to craft and mold you to be a, a stronger child of God. And we will work together to overcome this adversity, to rejoice again in the goodness and the fullness of all that God has to bring in our lives. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Hymn number 789, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. <laughs> 